Okay, hi everyone. I think we will begin. So thank you so more, much for attending this session today on accelerating sustainability in the textiles value chain, inspiring action and behaviour change. We are so pleased to have you here and delighted to be joined by such esteemed speakers to share their thoughts on this really important topic. My name is Rachel Arthur and I'm a writer and systems change strategist working with the UN Environment Programme on the topic of sustainable fashion. I'm thrilled to be here today to play the role of moderator. We will start with opening remarks from Elisa Tonda, head of the Consumption and Production Unit at UNEP. Then we will have just over 45 minutes with our panelists. During that time, towards the end, we will be welcoming questions from the audience. So do please share them throughout in the Q&A box that you can find here on the webinar function on Zoom. There's also a chat box if you wish to engage with each other and indeed with some of the panelists throughout the conversation. We look forward to doing so as much as possible with all of you. We will then close out with comments from Elizabeth Turk, Director of Economic Cooperation and Trade at the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. To start off, Elisa, may I please welcome you to the stage. Thank you very much, Rachel. And let me use this opportunity to wish a good day to everybody. And welcome also everybody to the session, Accelerating Sustainability in the Textile Value Chain, Inspiring Action and Behavior Change. Rachel, thank you very much for having accepted to be our moderator today and taking us through this one hour session. And I'm also very, very thankful to all the speakers who have agreed to be with us today and discuss this very interesting issue and to all the participants that are connected to the session. I think I'm going to start with a very obvious statement, but it's worthwhile to remind us that the textile industry is indeed one of global importance because it provides economic growth, it provides employment, it provides foreign exchange revenues, and its products are really essential to human welfare. So it's also an industry which can be responsible for significant environmental impacts and can trigger human rights and health issues. Just few facts and figures to position ourselves into this conversation. Clothing production approximately doubled in the last 15 years. And the number of time we're using garments before discarding them has decreased 36% and less than 1% of clothing is actually recycled into new clothing. This is actually corresponding to an annual cost to consumers that are actually throwing away clothing that can continue to be worn. And that cost is estimated to around 460 billion US dollars. Estimations are also telling us that this industry accounts for roughly 8% of world's greenhouse gas emission, that the apparel industry consumes 250 trillion liters of water per year and is responsible for an estimated 9% of annual microplastic losses to the oceans. It's clearly a call to bring in circularity and sustainability into the sector to reduce this impact. And that shift to a more circular and sustainable textile industry will really require globally coordinated approaches across regions and at all levels of the value chain and alignment across the different initiatives that are already active in this space. And this was precisely where UNEP's first report on sustainability and circularity in the textile value chain concentrated. It looked at the entire value chain. It identified key environmental and social hotspots in this system and mapped initiatives that were already active in addressing those hotspots. And in doing so, it helped us see where three big gaps exist and require additional focus and effort. One gap is around governance and the need to create incentives for new innovative business model that increase textile utilization and reduce consumption, be them fiscal policies on efforts around sustainable public procurement or regulations, but also a governance that looks at, that explores 
eco-design requirement or production standards that level the playing field. And above all, a governance that makes sure that these transition towards a sustainable and circular value chain is an inclusive and a just one that leaves no one behind. The second area of gap is around skills, funding opportunities and spaces for collaboration across actors in the value chain. So it has come as really very essential the fact that the shift towards circular and sustainable business model might require new skills, might require new solution and technologies, and that these require funding for these innovation to take place. And that spaces for collaborations across value chain actors are really needed to bring this transformation to scale. And the last area of gap that was identified in this first report was an area around consumption and the need to inspire change in consumers' attitude through campaigns, the needs to improve advertising and consumer information tools such as labels, the need to build acceptance for products longevity that reduces consumption and also to instill habits that reduce climate impact of garment care. And the question comes out uh, immediately on how to advance efforts on these three gaps. And this is where UNEP has been working since in bringing together in a unique and interactive exercise more than 100 experts from around the world that represents various stakeholders group in the different stages of the textile value chain to help us see which are the actions, which are the efforts that are needed to address these gaps. And these questions will actually be framed, uh, the responses to this question actually will be framed in a report that will be released by the end of this year. In a roadmap that helps us understand with a holistic understanding of the value chain, which are the roles of different actors, how the interdependencies of these roles can be played out, and how in a collaborative fashion, we can, the different actors can help each other removing barriers towards a more sustainable and circular value chain, and also achieve progress more quickly through collaboration. What we have heard also in the consultation is still stressing very much the importance of changing consumption habits to shift the needle and engage consumers at a global scale. And this is where a second knowledge product of UNEP is going to concentrate. And this knowledge product will be the sustainable fashion communication strategy that is going to focus on the role of consumer facing storytellers and the power of shifting the narrative to strengthen a demand for a more positive fashion future. Today, we will really be looking forward to our panel discussion that will help us see how value chain actors can really engage with individuals and equip them with the right information that allows them to make personal changes but also require urgent action from businesses and government and how a bottom-up demand can really create a systemic change in the entire textile sector. Obviously, when going through that, you will also have the chance to have few previews of the UNEP knowledge product that will be available later in this year. And while thanking you again very much for being with us today, Rachel, I hand it over to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Elisa. I will now welcome each of our panellists. You can see they all have their videos on already, which is great. Um, so first up, we have Arnu Passanier, Strategic Advisor on the Circular Economy at the International Department of the Ministry of Infrastructure and Water Management in the Netherlands. Welcome, Arnu. Thank Next you. Maya Penn, CEO and founder of Maya's Ideas, a 21-year-old award-winning environmental activist, artist, animator, eco-designer, sustainability consultant, three times TED speaker and author. Welcome, Maya. Thank you. Beth Greenaway, a sustainability leader within Zalando's digital experience team. Beth helps 45 million active customers discover and understand more sustainable fashion on the platform. Welcome, Beth. Hi, everyone. 
And last but not least, we have Sumya Kalari, founder of Dwij, which means second life in Sanskrit, and was founded to address the huge amount of textile waste that ends up in landfill or incineration. Welcome, Sumya. Thank you, Rachel. So as we've heard so eloquently from Elisa, we're here to talk about how to increase awareness of the environmental and socio-economic impacts of the textile sector and mobilize, mobilize consumer demand for more sustainable choices in order to drive bottom-up change. Anu, if I were to come to you first, if our overarching goal is of course a more sustainable and circular fashion industry, how important a role do you think greater consumer engagement specifically plays and what needs to happen to really enable this? Yes, thank you very much. Um, um, well, first, um, I think um, uh, consumers need to know um, what the impact on, on the environment uh, of textiles production and use uh, and discarding is. I think there is a huge uh, gap uh, to, uh, to fill um, and to, um, uh, to make clear that um, with the existing way of um, um, buying, using and discarding um, uh, a lot of textiles, uh, we have um, a tremendous impact on the environment, on chemical use of CO2 emissions, as uh, Elisa uh, Tonda said, and not to forget uh, water use. Um, if you take one pair of jeans, it costs uh, to, to only to produce, it costs 8,000 liters of clean water. And in the, the, um, the production industries are just there where water, um, uh, clean water is really scarce uh, and becomes more scarce uh, in, in the future. So um, one thing is um, uh, the uh, consumers need to know uh, what the impact is. At the same time, um, what we see and, and uh, Elisa um, uh, told already about is that the clothing is most uh, underutilized uh, of the products in the world. Um, so we should do something about reuse and, um, uh, um, uh, and um, uh, be, um, use those uh, products as long as possible. Um, but if we want to change those um, behavior, it's not that simple that we can have a, um, a sort of a communication um, uh, awareness campaign. Uh, that's not uh, what, uh, what does the trick. Um, if we listen to, to, um, um, uh, to scientists on, um, on consumer behavior, you have to um, keep in mind three crucial elements um, uh, which um, have to do the trick um, to change their behavior. First, it's of course the intrinsic motivation. So you have to um, give them uh, the right information. Uh, second is the, um, they have to be able to, to change their behavior. So the infrastructure should be in place uh, to make it possible for them to use, reuse and use um, 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 their, their, um, their clothing as long as possible and intensive as possible. Um, but third, and that's something is uh, what is um, uh, often underestimated is the social norm. Uh, people change only if the social norm is changing, if their environment is doing the same uh, as, as they do. But first to, to see how they can change their, their behavior themselves, it's of course buying less clothes. Um, that's the first one. It's um, prevention of uh, a lot of um, um, waste, but also environmental losses. Um, uh, and if they see that they 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 can love it, their, their clothes, they they will um, use it uh, uh, longer uh, and better. Um, uh, second, they can they should be able to uh, buy and sell and share. Uh, second-hand clothing. So there needs to be developed a, a, a complete new infrastructure where that's, that sort of things is possible. It's coming uh, on the market uh, right now, uh, at least in the Netherlands, but uh, I think it's um, all over the world. Um, but it should be um, much easier to, um, to access for, um, for consumers. And third is that 
people uh, wash their clothes uh, very often and they can use uh, those clothing um, without washing um, or, or with less washing than, uh, than, they, uh, than they did before. So that are elements of, uh, of change you can, can help them to, um, um, uh, to do. Uh, so it's um, easy to find uh, waste collection points uh, in shops in order to properly discard textiles. It's about vintage uh, clothes centers, web-based um, uh, marketplaces, um, but also sustainability labels, uh, which they easily can scan to, uh, to know what the impact is and what, uh, what they really buy. And of course, uh, Elisa uh, told uh, about price incentives, which are, um, uh, of course, um, uh, very important to change the mindset. Um, but in the end, it's um, also about um, that uh, people should, um, uh, that, that a large amount of people um, change their behavior in order to, to help change the rest. Um, so if you are, are going to um, do a public awareness campaign, um, you should be um, positive in, in your perspective, um, uh, concrete in what they can contribute. So a sort of uh, association campaign and a compliments campaign can help to, uh, to change their behavior. Wearing and reusing vintage clothing should in the end become the norm and it should become cool, easy, and cozy as well. So Thank you. But there's so many great points in there, so many th different things you've touched on. It's a really good scene setter for, I think, lots of what the others will be able to, to build on in terms of their expertise. But, but just pulling out two sections particularly, one was around awareness not being enough on its own, but that sort of importance of information, I think, and education within there. And then also the infrastructure. And I think that, that, that segues really nicely to you, Samia, in terms of the, the work that you've do, been doing. You obviously have a very big focus on education uh, th through through uh, through your platform, through your website, um, but also, of course, in terms of actually facilitating the, the work itself by having that infrastructure in place. So maybe you can just share a little bit about this and your thoughts on it as, a, as, as sort of in terms of the significance of that um, information piece as a, as a contributor to enabling change. Yeah, no, thank you for the question, Rachel. Uh, yeah, uh, when we started which we realized uh, the very important fact that we would be able to sell our used denim bags only if the person is aware why we are doing this otherwise the uh, thinking is like why are they even touching the waste and doing something from the waste so education naturally became a very integral part of our process because we re started realizing that there are a lot of people who would like to have a lot of understanding of what's happening to the environment but unfortunately, they do not have access to the information. And if they do have access to the information, most of the times it could, they could also end up in greenwashing kind of aspects. So it has become like a very, very important factor that we give the right information and uh, deliver it in a sense that that is easily doable and that is that can be easily integrated in their lifestyle. So, uh, so like we have seen that people have changed uh, after the education, they have changed to a certain extent that uh, they not only change their behavior change in textiles when they buy, but that also spills over to their other parts of uh, lifestyle. So education, I believe, and right education, right information is the only way forward. Uh, and we have seen so many people coming back and making sure that they deliver their used jeans to us, no, no matter how much the post postal charges could be. So uh, do, uh, like the other panelists mentioned about the incentives, uh, incentivizing of the products, for us, unfortunately, it didn't work out uh, so well because that did not lead to behavior change, but that led to more of uh, getting rid of their uh, clothes. So when we started educating, they started really understanding the importance and they take a genuine effort to uh, get back to us. Yeah, thank you.
Super interesting. No, thank you very much indeed. And I think, Beth, you know, again, this segues very nicely to you in terms of the, the sheer volume of, of customers that you obviously have access to, 45 million, it says in your bio. Um, maybe we can just turn to you a little bit in terms of what we've heard, just to talk about the key challenges that businesses such as Zalando face in, in being on that sort of front line of communications, if you will, about sustainability. Um, and, and also maybe you could share a little bit about how that breaks down in the terms of the way you think about it from a global to a regional or localized level yeah sure happy to I think I would agree with a lot of what's been said already and I think two of the points you know one is about education and awareness we've seen through the attitude behavior gap report that we published earlier this year that there's really a gap between what customers or consumers say that they would like to do and then what they actually do Um, and part of the reason for that is that around one in two of them don't actually understand what sustainability means in a fashion context so they understand about recycling they understand that they need to manage their waste but when it comes to fashion there's a lot of yeah confusion and a gap there and I think added to that that there's no kind of you know there's no industry-wide standard of what does sustainability in fashion mean what is sustainable fashion Um, and then we're yeah we're dealing with a lot of confusion so I think two things that that we're trying to do is, is first of all, work within the industry to create that common performance metric. So we're working super closely with uh, the Sustainable Apparel Coalition to build up the HIG index. Um, and so that's measuring performance at facility level, brand level and product level. And we launched the first um, transparency kind of part of that this year, which was uh, sustainability profiles, which we hope to launch soon on the platform. Um, but also thinking about, you know, what is the regulation that we need to also see to standardize that? So this is more talking from a European perspective, but there's a lot that's coming up in the coming months about how to actually make a claim about a product. We talked about sustainability labeling being a really important part. Um, so I think creating that kind of minimum baseline and that minimum standard is going to be super important for the future. But then I think we need to go beyond that. And we've talked about, you know, making it. Uh, understandable and I think I would even go further and say you know it needs to be simple but also super engaging and very tangible for people so it's often what we found is it's not enough just to have a label there or to have a sustainability certificate but actually to say what does that mean and let's talk about you know impacts on worker well-being in the supply chain let's talk about water conservation so I think when you start making these topics a lot more tangible and emotional and creating that connection Um, since we've kind of introduced more of that language we've seen a really big um, uptick in engagement Um, and I think yeah we just need more of that to keep going so this baseline and then kind of going beyond that and and pushing for behavior change. Yeah fantastic and and from that sort of global and localized level you're seeing that play out in that way as well? Yeah I would say so and the, the other thing I would add to that I mean obviously we have a European perspective but Europe is very, very diverse and we have, you know, tons of different languages. And I would say that sustainability as a word or circularity as a word is also very differently understood in different markets. So I think it's really about, you know, from a, even from a copy perspective, the the wording that you use and the way that you tell that, that story, um, carbon footprint, you know, isn't actually a thing in some countries, you know, you would explain it in a different way. So I think making sure that that's, that's understandable and that's still I would say where we're learning um, what different types of markets want and how different types of customers expect to see information and the information that they they kind of engage with the most. Indeed and and to our news point as well the infrastructure obviously very different in different markets. Yes exactly. Um, I should probably just say for everybody uh, listening, uh, Libra from the UNEP team is very kindly sharing lots of links to things that are being referenced. So the Attitude Behaviour Gap report from Zalando has been posted, um, as, as have some of the other examples, including the UNEP report um, on the textiles value chain. So do um, do take a look at all of those when you get the chance. Um, Beth, just, just one more question for you. I, I just wanted to ask what this actually then looks like when you talk about circular services specifically and, and whether you can just share an example with us of how that, how that plays out yeah I mean I think it's really interesting because we've been trying to be we're trying to communicate about sustainability for a number of years and now circularity is coming in and it's this other very abstract term that we kind of need to make a bit more tangible and understandable um I would say probably the most the biggest on the newest example that we've had is our e-commerce business pre-owned which we actually just celebrated the first anniversary of yesterday um and I think launching that business which is now in 13 of our markets has been a massive learning curve, um, very successful. But I think part of that has also been about, 
you know, showing or communicating about this new circular service in a way that doesn't get too connected to these very abstract scientific terms that might not be so, uh, you know, so much of a click for people. So how we've tried to do it is making the sustainability message a bit more indirect. So obviously there's an environmental benefit there, you know, reselling using clothes that already that already exist. Um, but, you know, other massive benefits are it's often cheaper, you know, it's much cheaper to buy something that's already there. And it's also this kind of treasure hunt aspect to, you know, trawling through and finding something really unique and special. And so I think it's not just about, you know, leading with that sustainability point. That's one important factor, but it's really about how do you package that within a really compelling service, um, which we're still, as I say, learning how to do and scaling it. Um, but that's something especially I think for the younger generation for Gen Z you know it's this kind of affordability uniqueness and the you know the environmental impact reduction that's really compelling. Yeah I think it's really interesting to think around that that package of messaging as, mm. as you referred to it. Maya to, to throw it over to you you know we have heard a lot about information I'd love to just talk a little bit within within that package of messaging how do you think we start thinking about aspiration and desire as a central part of, of sustainable fashion communications and do you think we can get to a point where we social proof sustainable fashion as Arnu mentioned at the beginning? Yes, I definitely feel that we can. And you know, as you know, we've kind of spoken to, there are so many people, um, you know, I'm a member of Gen Z, but there are people who from Gen Z and across all generations who are becoming more and more educated about the topic of the impact of the textile industry of the fashion industry on the environment, especially as the climate crisis continues to uh, intensify. And I think that it's really about changing the narrative. It's really about redefining what style is, what it, what luxury is. When you talk about like aspiration and, and desire, you know, a lot of people are aspiring to look like, you know, the, the celebrities or the influencers that they look up to, to meet the trends that are being pushed in, you know, some of the, the fashion magazines. And I think it's really about saying, and, and, and really in, in plain terms, just making this disposable linear way of utilizing textile and fashion uncool and making it non-desirable and saying, you know, upcycling, um, you know, wearing what you have, rewearing it, remixing it, um, buying secondhand, shopping your friends or your family's closet, making that something that is really fun and engaging for people. And I think that it's really up to the fashion industry. It's up to really big, really big, like plat people who are platformed within that industry and who really set the trends to shift that narrative of what really is luxury, what really is the definition of style, you know, not pressuring people into following trends and, you know, really encouraging people to find their own unique style, which is, is so incredibly crucial. And so I think that just kind of overall shifting the narrative is, is something that's really important. And, you know, all of the onus is not on the consumer because, you know, individuals have been pushed into feeling that they always need to get more, they always need to buy more by the industry, by design. And so I think that, you know, while there is this idea of, uh, of this industry being very consumer driven and being very uh, customer and market driven, it is also up to the industry to set the tone of, hey, here is what we are going to be doing that is more sustainable, that is, uh, it falls within the circular economy. And even if their customer base needs to be educated on that, I don't think that there will be a problem because they're already pushing a sort of narrative or a message of here's how much you need to buy and consume. And you know, don't worry about where it goes after you throw it away. And an average piece of fast fashion is designed to last no more than 10 wares. And we just kind of normalize that and just make it like, you know, like same way there's fast food, there's fast fashion and there, there's not an issue. When I think that, you know, like I said, more brands, celebrities, influencers, so on and so forth really need to step up and, and make this linear path that we're on right now just undesirable to the average person. 
Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you. And, and, and I love the sort of fact that you've already referenced there, the different types of stakeholders that are involved in this. Um, you, know, you mentioned celebrities at the beginning, but then obviously it ended, uh, ended on, on the industry. Uh, are there other, other groups that you think particularly need to have some sort of responsibility within all of this in terms of that, that specific angle we've said? I love the way that you've said, you know, we need to make it uh, the old practices uncool. Um, you know, that that is fundamentally what this industry is so capable of doing is determining, you know, what is aspirational in the first place um, who, who else do you think needs to be involved from a responsibility um, perspective and with that through that specific lens yeah I mean I think that there, there there are so many fashion industry jobs and anyone who is not within the fashion space might not fully realize just how long the chain is and so that can be the manufacturers and the large fast fashion brands that can be even the second hand shops because they don't you know manage a lot of their textiles uh, properly as well that could go to advertisers and the advertising industry and you know and and the media and, and journalist space as well. You know, what kind of narratives are people pushing? What kind of ad campaigns are these people taking on from which brands and do they really align with their values? And like the, there's, there's such a huge range that honestly, we could go over a, a whole list of the, the parties involved for an hour within itself. But I think that there will have to be a more intensive shift, not only to sustainability and circularity, but also environmental justice as well, because there are so many marginalized communities that have really been the most adversely impacted by this industry and by uh, environmental issues as a whole. And I think that it's really crucial to bring in that human connection into the industry as well, because that also educates consumers and in, and really shows people the human side of this industry. Thank you. And I'm going to come back and ask you to expand on that in, in just a moment. But but I love the point that you've made there. Indeed, we could certainly speak for at least another hour on just the topic of who, who who's responsible with through that lens of shifting the narrative. Um, but, it, but it's very interesting just to think about, you know, all of the different forces that currently drive consumption and how they all interplay here. Um, Arnu and, and Sumya, I want to throw it back to the two of you. Do, do, do you have an example in mind of a successful campaign or indeed a policy measure that you think um, was or, or or potentially more importantly will be able to really catalyze meaningful change and, and potentially behavior change through the lens of today's conversation. Yes, um, thank you for the for the question. Very good one. Well, uh, first of all, I think that the government uh, can do a lot um, uh, by um, um, by uh, uh, policy by by example by doing it themselves. So what we, um, what our minister um, uh, previously did um, and other ministers as well, was um, use secondhand clothing. Um, uh, use also uh, circular, uh, circular fabricated uh, uh, clothing and talk about it. Uh, so that's uh, um, what they uh, can do. We have our Ministry of Defense um, using, um, uh, secondhand fibers uh, to um, uh, to um, uh, to produce new uh, clothing for um, um, for the uh, military, um, and they have a really close loop um, uh, with um, uh, organizing that. Uh, so it's um, I think uh, that uh, that is one of the um, elements uh, which is uh, key to um, uh, to change the system. Uh, the same uh, counts, of course, for um uh making the industry uh, responsible for um, uh, for the linear approach um by um uh, introducing epr systems uh, extended producer responsibility sch schemes um but um at the same time it's not only about uh, the government uh, what uh, what they, uh, can they do uh, it's also about uh, the local governments um, um uh, coming into contact with the clothing stores uh, to um, to make it possible to to have um, a collection um, uh, of discarded uh, garments um, uh, made possible and making it um, attractive to do. Uh, so it's also about the local environment, which uh, which should be uh, which should be in place. 
Um, and of course, um, we can and and we do in the Netherlands. We invest uh, also as a national government in building up the infrastructure to sort and recycle um, uh, fibers um, uh, again. Uh, and we invest a lot, not only in sorting, cutting and cleaning and mechanical recycling, but also in chemical recycling um, that can be that, that can add a, add a, a lot to, um, uh, to recycle more. Uh, at the same time, and to answer one of the questions of the, of the audience, um, what does that mean for, um, um, uh, for underdeveloped countries uh, and the, the, the production uh, uh, workers over there? And I say they have to change as well. Uh, but it's it's the the whole world sh should be uh, circular, and that means that uh, production workers now uh, using new um, uh, new cotton, uh, they um, they have to use recycled cotton. They can have um, other uh, lines of production, which is um, more about refibering and um, reuse of uh, of those uh, of those clothing. So. Um, we we have to make the transition, all of us uh, together, and um, uh, happy to sh to um, to build on that um, uh, internationally. Thank you so much, Samia. Over to you. Same same question. Uh, yeah. Uh, so we do a lot of awareness drives in communities, corporates, and schools. What we saw from our drives uh, is that the best of what we could get is from the school students. Uh, so we see that, uh, you know, uh, elderly people or people who have a lot of understanding are a little shy from, they have resistance to change. But the kids are so uh, happy to take these changes that we have seen that the kids have made sure that the parents also follow what they uh, have been taught. So for us, like I couldn't talk, I, I, I don't think I can talk about the policies, but campaigns where uh, kids are taught more about sustainability at young age and people where uh, kids, do, those who learn to compost or make say bioenzymes or like to understand uh, which fabric it is, all these things make a lot of difference when they grow up and they also help to, uh, their parents to make change. Uh, so this has been our learning. Yeah, that's super interesting, and I guess reflects back on on some of the comments Maya was making around around Gen Z. Um, Maya, just to, to bring that back to to your your other point then around the marginalised voices, I, I'd love you just to expand on that a little bit in terms of the voices that we feel are missing from the current narrative around sustainable fashion and what they can bring to the table. And I suppose that links in with what Anu has just been talking about as well in terms of some of the garment workers around the world um, and their their place within all of this discussion. Absolutely, it directly ties in. And, you know, I, I think people that are really missing from the, the larger conversation are Black, Brown, and Indigenous communities in the Global North and communities in the Global South. Um, we do need to also specifically have more uh, conversations and hear more from garment workers as well, because many of those people fall within that community as well, within those communities. I also feel that um, the disabled community needs to be brought more into the conversation because they're going to be so adversely impacted by environmental crises. And then also their uh, approach they have to take to, to the fashion world is one that's very nuanced and often overlooked. Um, and same thing with uh, communities of color being the most adversely impacted by environmental issues. And I think something that's so crucial that is really important to say, it's not just about you know, oh, these people are going to be the most adversely impacted, but it's also about realizing so many of our communities already have the solutions. They just need the resources to be able to scale those solutions. Uh, and it's, it's really, I think, sometimes there's more harm done than good when you don't engage directly with those communities and say, what do you already have in place that is already working? You're seeing you know, evidence and tangible change and how can we help you? And by like going to those communities and actually asking instead of saying, here's what we're going to do. I think it's really important to engage on a more holistic level um, because I think it creates more of a tangible change. There's uh, an example, I'm on the board of an organization called The Revival. They're based out of Accra, Ghana, and they are doing really incredible work. Uh, the, the, the fashion industry, specifically secondhand textile waste, has really adversely impacted Ghana 
uh, the, the environment there. There's so much textile waste on the beaches, as well as the Ghanaian textile industry and Ghanaian culture that is very intertwined with fashion. And so all of that being said, the work that the revival is doing is incredible and they're, they're helping the local artisans there have uh, opportunity to be able to create new pieces from that secondhand textile waste. And once again, there are thousands and you know probably even millions of examples of initiatives like these within so many communities, both in the global north and the global south that really just need, again, the, the resources and the support um, from industry and global leaders in order to scale on, on a sustainable level. Um, and so, like, like I said, there's so many solutions that are already there in marginalized communities. It's not about talking to them, it's talking with them and really figuring out the, the best solutions that will be also um, adaptable and non-exploitable as well. So that's what I would add. Yeah, thank you. I think there's a lot there in the, yeah, not, not talking at, but with these communities. And that, that's a huge, huge part of all of this. Um, I'm, I'm very aware of time and want to make sure that we leave lots of space for questions. I can see tons are coming in and some fantastic uh, conversation also happening in the chat. Um, so maybe I'll just pose one more question to, to all of the panelists to ask you to answer. Um, I, I've been thinking a lot about how we engage citizens beyond just behavior change to, in, to empower them to demand better. Better. Um, and, and we've heard a lot about that today in terms of demanding better of the industry and of government and how all of these things fit together with that focus on, on shifting the narrative. But if you could each get one message out to any of these key stakeholder groups, whether it be citizens, industry, government, you name it, I'd love to hear from each of you what it would be. And maybe you could just answer in one sentence, if possible, for the sake of time. Um, Beth, sorry to put you on the spot, but I'll throw it over to you first, if that's OK. Sure, I think I'd echo Arnold from, from earlier. I think everyone needs to play their part. Um, people need to all ask questions, whether that's companies, uh, citizens, businesses, um, and take responsibility, whether that's through voting, through you know asking for policy changes, through looking at your own business and seeing what improvements you can make. Excellent, thank you. Arnu, as you had mentioned, I'll, I'll pass it over to you and if you have a build on that. Um, yes, um, um, I would say to, to all, um, prepare yourselves it's um, uh, change will be uh, quicker than than we think because the need is really high so uh, governments will, all, all over the world will um, uh, take measures to uh, to change the system um, but we do it together with uh, with industry along the supply chain uh, to make um, uh, the changes needed um, uh, also for the for the workers uh, in the production countries because they need uh, a better environment, they need better jobs, um, uh, also livable wages. And at the same time, uh, we, um, with the climate change and the biodiversity loss uh, coming to us, um, it, um, we, uh, we, uh, we are in a hurry. Excellent, thank you. Prepare yourselves and yeah, we are definitely in a hurry. Samia, over to you. Oh, I think Samia's screen may have frozen. That's not just me, is it? Um, uh, oh, there you are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm back. I'm back. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, I think for everyone, uh, my message would be to consider the informal sector that is doing a lot of work parallelly along with the governments or uh, with the businesses. So especially in Indian context, we have a lot of uh, informal sector that is you know, toiling hard to bring down this environmental impact. So we should all respect them and also take them along. Great. Last but not least, Maya, to you, and then we will open to the floor. I think that, you know, I want to say to, you know, that people are more than just consumers. You know, people are, are change makers, are visionaries, are voters, are, you know, are, people are more than just what they buy and they can do more than buying in order to make an impact. You know, some people are speaking with their dollars. Some people are speaking with who they put into their, uh, their government offices. Some people are speaking with when they reach out to these fast fashion brands that are, you know, exploiting garment workers that are polluting our planet, reaching out to them, creating 
educational materials and awareness, you know, around this topic to help share this information with their own circles, whether it be in social media and so on and so forth. I think, you know, to really remember for all people who are, you know, listening and feel like they're on the outside of this conversation, this conversation pertains to everyone. Everyone does have an impact. And I do believe in the power of collectivism. And then I think that I also want to speak specifically to brands, industry leaders, government leaders. We have to make this shift to sustainability. And you know, the, the, the companies specifically that will survive will be the ones that are sustainable because this education and awareness is growing rapidly every day. I think that it's the sustain that sustainability is not the future, it is the now. We need to act sooner rather than later. And there needs to be more of a respect and transparency between brand and customer as well. And just really shifting the entire mindset on both sides so that we can create a more just and uh, sustainable world through fashion. Brilliant. Thank you, Maya. And I can tell we've certainly got a great group of change makers here with us today. Um, and we certainly have in the audience as well. We've got so many questions coming in. Please do continue to add them. Um, I'm going to try and get um, each question, just one of you to answer, if that's possible. And if you could keep your answers really, really tight, it just means we can get through as many as possible because we do only have about 10 minutes to do so. Um, so let's try this first one. This is from uh, Margarita Jardim. She says, what do you think will make people shift from fast fashion to second Secondhand or sustainability focused fashion. There are many drawbacks for people how to overcome this. Um, Beth, is that maybe something you would like to take? Yeah, sure. I think it's about, well, it's a lot of the things we've talked about already. I think it's making it really exciting and attractive and aspirational. But I think it's also about having a really compelling service offer that touches on many of those things. So, you know, making sure that people with lower incomes can afford it, making sure that it's affordable, making sure that it's, you know, it's quick and it's easy to do. You don't have to wade through a ton of information. So I think removing some of those barriers um, will be key. And also just, you know, getting prepared for the future. I think we've, we've heard from some of the panelists, you know, the time is now, we have to move fast. And I think there's a lot of work happening in the industry because companies know that they need to change. Um, so I think we'll see a lot coming. Great, thank you. Uh, next one is from Anita Chester at the Louders Foundation. Uh, for many years now, there is a lot of noise around mapping, research, data on impacts, but not comparable action or investments for shifting the system. As knowledge products, sustainability labels and voluntary action alone have not cut it, what more can this group do to move the needle? Um, Arnu, should I maybe throw that one to you? Yes, um, I think um, uh, one of the... Um, um, the sectors which can have a huge impact uh, uh, worldwide is the financial sector. If the financial sector um, um, is uh, uh, will challenge the industries uh, to to change their behavior, to ch to change uh, their um, environmental impact, um, and of course they need a lot of data and the right indicators and uh, harmonized uh, uh, standards, etc. But uh, in the end. They are now developing uh, strategies to to uh, to do more, um, but it should be the default um, in their lending and uh, and investment practices. Uh, they should take um, uh, sustainability and uh, circularity into account as a as a as a default. Um, and I think uh, if they um, can work together with governments, but also to uh, together with industry, because in the end, um, we need a lot of innovations, and the industry is able to 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 change their system uh, better than we are. Uh, so um, I would like to um, to work together also with industry, with NGOs, um, and uh, and other stakeholders to uh, uh, to help change the system. But uh, finance is uh, is key, I think. Lovely, thank you. Um, Maya, I'm going to put this one to you. Um, this is from Sophie Fitzgerald. She asked, do you think fast fashion companies can be trusted to educate consumers on the impacts of fast fashion and sustainability? In all honesty, that's a very, that's a very loaded question because my answer is kind of no. I feel like you will need 
third party influence, with fact checkers, with people who are really willing to step in and tell consumers what the the granted the ugly truth is because brands will always have some kind of a spin they'll always have some kind of a you know a marketing tactic woven in we already are seeing this with sustainable initiatives and with greenwashing and in some ways and some brands are doing really great some brands not so much uh, i think that you know if there is more of a general consensus for uh, for people to know what to look out for and to know also, and unfortunately, this puts this back on the individual to know this person feels like or this brand feels like they aren't telling the full story. And you just kind of, you know, know that from your own knowledge and research. And this goes back again to saying what Beth was saying around making this information accessible and understanding what really means and really means to sustainability and circularity and what really doesn't. Um, so either bringing in, a, you know, someone from a third party uh, to to leave that or having more accessibility to what it all really means at the end of the day. Yeah, that's just what I would add. No, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, Samia, I'm going to put this one to you. Um, this is a question that comes from Tony in Canada. It says that um, in Canada, estimates are that 85% of post-consumer textiles are going straight to landfill. While we can reuse and recycle most, 95%. Barriers are convenience and education. How can we harness governments to help move this needle? Maybe you can talk about that through your lens where you are. Uh, yeah, um, so I think uh, infrastructure plays a very major role here. Uh, like even though if you want to do a big change, so for example, we uh, as a man, like someone who use only raw material, we have always faced this challenge that there are there is a gap between the person giving away and the gap between us buying them. So there's this a very big um, opportunity that can be like, um, like you know, maybe government could uh, step in here or like maybe even corporates could come and say that, hey, we give, we collect it. We may not take the responsibility of these things, but we know whom to direct. So it's a... okay. uh, we seem to be losing to time to change. Yes. Just got you at the end there again. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, we'll, we'll hop on to the next one. That's great. Um, I'll, I'll throw this one open if anybody wants to take it. Um, this is from Camon. He asks, what will incentivize brands to produce less or change to circular business models urgently? Is consumer demand in the past seven to eight years not enough to shift right now? If anybody wants to jump in on that. Um, I'm happy to. Yeah, right. I think I think it's a mixture of everything. I think, you know, we are seeing that shift. We're seeing a ton of stuff. I think a lot of it is still in the in the pilot phase um, because circularity is new and it's it's a whole different service area that, you know, brands are really exploring. Um, I think policy is a really key tool there. And we've seen, we're seeing a lot coming out of the European Union around circular economy and creating the systems for that. Um, and I think we've talked a lot about infrastructure already. So, you know, a brand can make some great shifts on its own, but ultimately you need to have that infrastructure set up in your local area to enable that, you know, those material flows. Um, so I think we're also talking about massive investment also in the communities and on a, on a local government level as well. So I think it's, it's not just brands. I think there's some work happening and there's more that needs to be done, but I think it's, it's a whole system shift. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think we've got time for a couple more. Uh, there's one here from uh, Claire. Again, I'm going to open this to any of you. How do fast fashion retailers best overcome the margin challenges they face to become more sustainable and change the mindset of the customers who tend to be the younger market looking for cheap, affordable fashion on a regular basis? Um, so this, I think, ties into some of the narrative stuff we were, we've been we've been talking about. I don't know if anybody wants to just hop in and add on that one. Uh, I can add on that one, and you know, I'm I'm someone who's you know worked as a sustainability consultant with small startups and Fortune 500 companies and everything in between, and I think that you know, when it comes to some of the the larger brands, I think that you know it really is. It, it really is kind of evident that 
um, they they have the means to to actually make these shifts um, because of how much they have profited off of you know being leaders within fast fast fashion spaces within fast fashion brands in particular that are you know very large and global. I think that it kind of is about making that decision to you know produce less, create sustainable products that are more affordable, it can be done. And it's kind of actually as simple as that for larger brands. It's just that they really would, you know, choose not to because they just don't want, they don't want to be inconvenienced. They don't want to have to overhaul their current pipeline. They don't want to have to overhaul their current system. Um, and I think that we really also need to take a look at how we can reform the secondhand uh, clothing sector as well and the, the circular economy sector because you know a lot of young people who you know want more inexpensive clothing but in a way that is you know more sustainable have been turning to thrift stores and, and secondhand stores but I think that you know again kind of what I spoke to earlier there's a huge issue with textile waste even within that sector as well. And so it's like, you know, this is a more affordable alternative and it's, it's secondhand, uh, but at the same time, a lot of that is still not going to a buyer. A lot of that is still ending up in a landfill somewhere in a country uh, in the global South. And so I think that's something else to kind of consider as well. Of course, you know, you, you have to tackle all areas in order to make everything more accessible. And you also have to take into account the value and what goes into creating a piece of fashion as well and making fashion more of an investment. I think sometimes having that mindset as a consumer is important as well. Brilliant, thank you very much. I think we're probably gonna to have to pause there on the questions. I'm sorry for all of the ones that we haven't been able to get to. Maybe I could ask the panelists um, during the closing remarks if you have time to, to see if there's any that you want to answer in the chat or indeed on the Q&A box, you can, you can type your answers. I'm sure everyone would be incredibly uh, appreciative. Um, otherwise, um, I want to hand over to Elizabeth Turk for our closing remarks. Um, just a, a huge thank you from me for everyone for being here and to all of our panelists as well. That was incredibly insightful. For Elizabeth, over to you. Many thanks. And let me start with really congratulations to the organizers, UNEP, for, for an amazing event. And it's clearly important to look uh, at the textile sector, at the fashion sector, a sector with such uh, significant environmental and social impacts. And I think Elisa at the beginning, she has given us some impressive numbers why it's so important to look at that sector. Um, I'm very pleased on behalf of UNSE to be part of this debate here. Um, because for us, it's what we are one of the United Nations uh, economic, regional economic commissions. Uh, we are really spanning from Canada to Central Asia. And I think today we heard a lot about the importance of diversity and looking also at the global south. We heard about India, we heard about Ghana. And with my contribution, I'd like to say, let's uh, also look at countries with economies in transition, which form a big part of the European market. And I'd like to bring that to your attention a little bit. In UNECE, the circular economy is of great importance to us. Our member states have identified that as our priority topic uh, earlier this year. So I'm, I'm very pleased to see that these topics of circularity, they make their way into intergovernmental machineries. Now, very uh, pleased to engage here today. What, what are some key points that I found in this amazing discussion? Well, the first point I think really is the importance of engagement and, and cooperation between the different agencies, including the UN agencies. And we've heard from Elisa the call for a global coordinated action across continents and across agencies. And I think that's really happening. And uh, it's very important on such a cross-cutting topic as circular economy, where we have an environmental angle, we have a social angle, we have an economic angle, such a transversal topic really needs engagement and cooperation between many, many different actors to deal with that interdependence. And I think that also really matters for the UN, because only if we have that joint engagement, then we can create the change that we owe to the world. Um, second point, zooming into the communication angle. And it was really inspiring to hear all of you talking about the importance of shifting the narrative that Elisa mentioned from, from the UNEP import. Uh, it was wonderful, Maya, to listen to you. You also brought us the, the perspective of fun and engagement and how, how this can, can really help. 
And uh, I would like to take a step back here and say, why is it so important to really look at communication and to look at the consumer? And I guess if we take the UN language and we look at circular economy and the SDGs, particularly SDG number 12 on sustainable production and consumption, we realize that the production sector has been looked at quite a bit, but what we really miss is the consumption angle. And that's where the consumers come in. And so that's why I really think your debate here today about communicating with the consumers is fundamental to, to creating that change. Now, what do we need in that regard? We need to inspire and empower the consumers. And I think that came out quite clearly when Arnaud talked to us about the intrinsic inspiration, the social norms. And we also heard about the potential of of the education, for example, when Sumaya mentioned the importance of talking to the kids and uh, to, to use the schools for inspiring consumers for change. So I think that's really, really important. And I'm sure that the, the report and the roadmap prepared by UNEP, it will guide us in, in that direction in terms of like inspiring the consumers and, and creating change through that. Now, inspiration alone is maybe not enough. We also need to empower the consumers to do the right thing. And we heard about this gap between inspiration and action. And uh, what can we do here? And there, I guess there are several dimensions. There is that sustainable and circular products need to be available. Um, the, the option of sharing clothes uh, uh, needs to be available. And I think for me, it was quite interesting that in today's debate, you don't only talk about products, but you also talked a lot about the services economy. And I think, Bess, you, you talked about Zalando in this regard. We heard uh, sharing of clothes, different types of washing. So I think availability of these new circular services is sort of like a key aspect. Secondly, we need really information about the sustainability dimension of these products or services. And here, the tricky thing, I think, is that information needs to be available and trustable. And in your discussion here today, you mentioned terms such as like greenwashing, and uh, that might really be an important issue to look at. And that's why I would like to, to bring to you what UNECE is doing in our project on ESG traceability of supply chains. So we are tracing or we are helping to trace supply chains in the textiles and footwear sector and to look at the environmental and social aspects of these supply chains. And this is really uh, to allow in consumers to make an informed choice that uh, to, to ensure that the labels that are being attached to the products, that they are correct and trustworthy. We are doing that right now with a blockchain pilot where we are basically tracing cotton from the farm to the shop so that what you mentioned in, in the flyer and the advertising of today's event that if you buy a t-shirt and you want to make a sustainable choice, that you can be sure about the sustainability of this t-shirt. And I'm, I'm very proud of this UNECE project. And I think it brings together some of our strengths on the one hand, that it's a whole toolkit of recommendations with policy options that go through our UN intergovernmental machinery, but that it also delivers something very concrete, namely that assurance for the consumers that when they um, choose a product that that has really been produced in a sustainable or in a circular way. So as I mentioned, we are testing that, that's currently still in the test phase. And I hope that together with you all, we can take that very important topic forward. We are doing our project with a wide range of stakeholders and in this regard have also looked at uh, or have issued a call to action where governments, industry actors, and also civil society can endorse that call to action and can tell us about what they are doing, what their company is doing, what their initiative is about. And so I would really like to invite you all also to join our UNECE call to action for transparency, environmental and social governance transparency in the textiles and footwear sector. I've definitely taken a lot of inspiring and informative messages out of today's debate. It's been a great pleasure for me to listen and I'm very excited about taking that forward. Thank you very much, Rachel. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And, and just once again, thank you to everybody for being here. I think those messages around feeling inspired and empowered are a very wonderful note to end on. Um, thank you to our audience for incredible engagement and please do stay in touch. Lots of links have been posted in order for you to do so. Um, thank you once again to everyone for being here and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.